Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet a woodworker, a sculptor, uh, an entrepreneur for sure, but a person that just makes lots of stuff. And they've recently launched a website that they have their own personal website, but they just launched a website that's something they want to be kind of a model for people selling their own work online, creating a cart, trying to get the word out there. And we talk about all that. We talk about how they promote it, how they do word of mouth, where a lot of their commissions come from, and just managing these large, awkwardly shaped things that they make. It was such a fun conversation. I'm glad that I met the person. And here is these uh, episodes starting right now. I'm Sylvie Rosenthal, and I am a woodworker, sculptor, designer, and educator, um, sort of all housed under the bracket of artist um, here in Madison, Wisconsin. And first, you are here in Madison, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Are you originally from here? I am not. Oh, I am where not. are you from? I'm originally from New Haven, Connecticut, but I have lived in a number of places, including I spent a formative part of my youth in Austin, Texas, and then I went to school in upstate New York, and then I spent a formative part of my 20s in Western North Carolina in the mountains, and then I've lived in San Diego, and here, I say I like to, I, I feel like I've gotten a lot of the mid-sized cities under my belt. Yeah. God, you made me feel like I've done nothing with my life. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So what brought you to Madison? Um, so in 2010, I was invited out to do a residency in the wood shop, in the wood program at the art department at the university. Oh. Um, so I came out here. And I ended up meeting my sweetheart here and I moved to California for a while. And then I was like all of my shop, my, I'd put my shop in storage in Asheville. And I was like, do I want to go to grad school or do I want to start another studio? And I was like, well, if I start another studio, I'll probably never go to grad school. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if I wanted to, it's very hard to uh, be in grad school and make a relationship work. So mm. it I wouldn't like know. <laughs> it makes sense to move here where my sweetheart had um, had created a life. And, you know, I also didn't want to go into huge debt for grad school. So UW was a place that I could um, get tuition remission. Okay. So you did it for love is what you're saying. Yeah, half for love, half for grad school. Yeah, and I never <laughs> moved anywhere for love. So that felt like a, I was like, okay, it was a big, to be honest with myself about it. Okay. Now, a question for you. You said you were good, you know, you could either start another studio. What does that entail? So when you say that, is that like opening a shop? Like, what is the outcome of starting a studio somewhere? I guess. And this is for me, I, I guess I wasn't following that because I don't do it. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> Yeah, so I had been in a studio with two other folks in Asheville and decided that I either needed to like get a full-time assistant and sort of like dig in harder, mm -hmm. but I wasn't, I didn't feel like that was, there was no good reason. Like I was like, I could, but I'm interested, like I'd been offered to come to this residency and then it made sense for me to like pull all my equipment out of that studio and put it in storage. Okay. So I took all of my machines and put them in storage. And just because of the, my medium, there's a lot of, there's infrastructure mm -hmm. that's needed for me to do my work. So it would mean like getting a space and setting it up, which is not an insignificant investment of time and dollars. Yeah. And how big does some of your work get? I mean, I, I've seen some of your work and it, it's one of the curses of getting a great photograph. It's like, it looks great, but you're wondering, what is the actual scale that I'm looking at here? So how big does some of your work get? Yeah, some of it gets pretty big, like seven feet tall. It really depends wow. on the, like, if it's my art, 
yeah, it can get like seven feet tall. Um, furniture can get big when I make furniture on commission. Um, but that usually like that has a destination. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a lot to like store stuff or ship things. You okay. Know. Yeah. Um, moving stuff around is, yeah. Do you currently That's have like different places in the world where your stuff is still just sitting in a locker somewhere? I mean, I hope not. Um, <laughs> no, all of my stuff is now with me. Okay. Um, if it doesn't, if it hasn't found a home, it's all here in my studio. So I, I'm not like in 20 places but i have stuff you know in a couple different like if it's out it's being shown somewhere and then it gets received back if it doesn't sell okay and you explained that you do some commissions for furniture and then you also mm -hmm. explained the different type of work you did when we started the show how would you explain your work or are there different facets to your work like how do you go about explaining it to people yeah, I mean, it's sort of hard to come up with a good elevator pitch because right. I like to, I consider myself a sucker for an interesting prompt. Uh -huh. um, and everything I do sort of ties into, like they all play in and they're all interwoven, but I make sculpture um, that has a lot to do with different histories of trade and extraction and the material, like, how botanical materials traveled around the world and continue to travel around the world and really? the different economies of biomasses and extraction, but also like histories of landscape and how landscapes have changed and what comes things that sort of um, jumped ship, mm -hmm. you know, with were either brought or um, on purpose or not on purpose. Um, and within that, there's a lot of different, you know, and I say history is because there's not one story. And so a lot of my work has, um, several different, like different meanings that sort of like constellate around and, you know, come together and fall apart that there's like a lot of layers of meaning. Mm -hmm. within within my sculptural work. And then I make, I have a small production line um, of home goods that I recently oh. launched my website, which was, took so long to build. Um, and that's, my studio is called Lower Astronomy Studios. And that's, the website is lowerastronomystudios.com. And we still have a lot more to build out. But um, I couldn't, there yeah yeah so we do a lot of different things i also make um like hands-on play and learning kits for kids okay so i teach both kids and adults i've been teaching for a really long time i've been teaching kids younger than myself since i was 17 and teaching adult classes oh, wow. in woodworking since i was 27 so i've taught all over the country i've taught in asia um and then we do furniture on commission, sort of like anything that people need custom. I do only custom work, um, mm -hmm. anything from like tables to cabinets to shelving to whatever. Because I do believe that um, small independent studios like mine are an asset to my community. Yeah. Right. That we don't have to take the world as pre-designed to us. Yeah. Right. That we can make things that we want to have in the world. And I feel like especially right now, it's like I like my I like people to know that it's like it's a really like fucking radical thing to buy handmade work now mm -hmm. and something that's ma made to last. And um yeah, that it's and it's a very intentional thing when people do it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, most of it ends up being extremely high end work, um, but I can dial it into lots of different levels. Um, I do work with our local library system. I work with the bubbler. Yeah. And if um, and the bubbler is a really wonderful. What do you do for them? To have in town. 
what do I do for them? I've designed programming. I've taught a bunch of classes at different branch libraries. Um, I do whenever they need stuff done, like outfitted for the bubbler room. They let me know what they need. Okay. Um, I just built a really big wishing well sculpture. Oh, cool. For, I like designed and built it for um, a resident artist. Like she had the idea and we sort of like, and that's what I like in working with people, like sort of figuring out the idea of what works for them. And that's like, whether I'm building commissioned sculpture, I have like a set of questions that have all these like subtle tactics to sort of get behind what people, you know, they may think that they want something, but how to really make it um, suit them. Okay. Well, and that's, that actually leads into the question that I was going to ask. Now you said you do commission work and... Uh, one, I wanted to know what are some of the more unique things that you've been asked to do, first of all. Um, yeah, let me know um, that. <laughs> a really fun one that I did that I finished in 2021 was a large whale with a small city on its back. I saw that. So someone commissioned mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Yeah. I would have thought the other way around. All right. Yeah, so I have a series that I've done that's like combines animals and architecture. So another thing in my sculptural work is sort of the, I do a number of pieces of work that all sort of fall, fall under like uncommon objects. And a lot of them are hybrids, like things that are put together that you wouldn't think would be put together and sort of collapsing Linnaean taxonomy. And all of it is under like, yeah, creating a state of that there's like always an aspect of wonder, whether it's like even, you know, like even in like some of the heavier content within my work, there's always within it a sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. um, this last year, I did a large suite of objects for um, a condo on the 90th floor of the John Hancock Tower in Chicago. And so that really allowed me to flex a lot of my like technical woodworking skills because okay. it was a very technical project. We made like five different custom sliding doors, oh, bookcases, neat. kitchen island, floating shelves. And it was all like I had um, custom plywood made and all of this had like integrated lighting within it. So, you know, I'm always up for a good technical challenge too. Okay. How do you find jobs like that? That was from an in-town client re referred me to a friend. Okay. And so, I mean, that's a great question. It's like um, mostly by word of mouth and that's why it's important to like get this website going um, yeah. because it is, you know, being a full-time studio artist is a hustle. You know, I'm mm -hmm. an independent artist and I pay my people that, you know, I have some people who help me out. I pay a living wage and I hire LGBTQIA, like people who would feel marginalized in a mainstream wood shop, that mm -hmm. it's like a safe space that we can, where like the conversations can be different and um, we can talk about all sorts of things. You know, there are very few wood shops in which people talk about their bodies. And yeah. like, you know, <laughs> what goes on and like, you know, people feeling like they can come to work just as they are. Like, if, even if you're not having a good day, like you don't have to pretend. Yeah. You know. <laughs> okay. And the, uh, that leads me to another thing too, is with the website when, I mean, sure, it's one thing just to go, I'm offering commissions and yes, we're, it, word of mouth is really a good way to go about doing that. But yeah, having the website, it's showing what you have done in the past, what your capabilities are. Just like I asked, like how big can your pieces be? Like sometimes people don't think that a local person could do something like make doors that could go into a building or, mm -hmm. something, you know, you're thinking small because I mean, that's what it's called. Small business owner. <laughs> it's, it's not thinking up to scale. So yeah. So building yeah. this website, it, it, does it help people get an idea of what, you can do for them or uh, it, so there's still a lot we still have a lot of room to grow on the website so for a long time i was like my art is what i want 
like behind my name and the things that I do to finance the studio were not under that umbrella. So this new oh. website, I also want it to be a model for other people making it a living in the arts that like you do a lot of things like I've built houses. So, you know, when COVID happened and all other sorts of business like changed, I helped a woman do you know, she'd been a student of mine. At, I've taught at Madison College there um, in the construction and remodeling program. Okay. I helped them develop a, a, a course, sort of continuing ed course, how to use power tools and make things, which is a lovely class um, that it got shut down. And this woman was like, I want to remodel my bathroom, but I want to help do it. And like, mm -hmm. and I was like, I can give you two days a week and you can borrow, like, I'll leave tools there so you can work on it. You know, that like and um, that it takes a number of different kinds of skills to build, you know, to fill everything in. So I do need to I haven't been as good at collecting photographs of that sort of stuff. And that's been a really big lesson. So oh, I'm guilty I need of to that, get a too. Lot, yeah, <laughs> a lot more photographs taken, you know, because like I did a kitchen for some friends in town and I only have the the photos from my phone. So me and my photographer are going to go around. We sort of focused on the home goods and the kids kits first, and then we'll build out like the sculpture page, you know, and it's a sale, it's e-commerce for the home goods and the kits. And it'll be like a site that will house the sculpture and people can make inquiries on it. But the smaller sculpture, which I call like uncommon objects, will be for sale um and then the commission work will just have like a number of images because i'll work for like i made a table a really large table with a bunch of different kinds of inlay for um the wisconsin memorial union to hmm. celebrate the 150th anniversary of enrolling women Okay. You know, so it was like this women's table. And that was a really interesting project to work with them on the design and the build. Um, and then, you know, I work with a number of local artists making the like literal and metaphorical support structures for their work. I've made a bunch of like hemp threshing tools for the School of Human Ecology. Mm -hmm. um, so we do so many different things. And I it's a sort of a bananas way to run a business, but I also love it right. that we're doing a lot of different things. Yeah. And you said that you were hoping that this new site could be the second site. Cause you also have a personal website, but now you have this new other website. You were hoping that yep. it could be a model. So what was, was there a thought process beforehand or are you just kind of mapping it out now as you're building it? Like what is the model that you're hoping that it can be for other small business owners? So I couldn't find like a comparable website to yeah. like what I wanted this to do. So it, a lot, it will allow for like direct sales because a lot of the work, it's really hard to only get 50% of mm -hmm. your sale price. And it's become increasingly hard, especially with material prices being like extremely unstable. And in the, you know, 15 or 20 years I've been making mirrors, like costs from mirror glass to shipping boxes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Have just gone up ex exponentially. Um, and it's just harder and harder to sell at wholesale. Mm -hmm. um, so to have it be a direct sales site, but also like let people know about my about the studio and its mission mm -hmm. um, that we want. Um, yeah, to inspire like LGBTQ and like BIPOC people who have been traditionally marginalized from wood shops. Like, I don't like, I find a lot of things are like pie in the sky that I'm like, how did they get all that equipment? Like, I'm pretty <laughs> scrappy, but I've also bought every piece of equipment in my studio. Uh -huh. You know, like, nobody's paid for it for me. And I want that I feel like there needs to, there there's room for, um yeah like some spaces that like yeah it's a hustle but people mm -hmm. can do it mm -hmm. you know it's like 
more than making, especially in crafts, I feel like it's not just making a living, it's making a life. Like a lot of my colleagues are my closest friends um, out in the, you know, nationally. And that showing that like all of the different things my studio needs to do to be funded, mm -hmm. you know, and to fund itself because it is like self-supporting. Um, and yeah, and that we get to make, you know, sculpture, but I, you know, like I wish that that was more of the full-time gig, but that's not. The like, sculptures you're saying? Yeah. Like I would love to make more sculptures and get more sculpture commissions, but even like, I want people who can't afford a sculpture to still be able to live with a unique piece of art. So it's important to me to have things that a number of different price brackets. I could see why that is that way though, because a sculpture is a hard thing to conceive and explain for someone to do. Whereas if you go, I'd really like a, I'd like a really cool table made from like an old door. That's really simple to think of. Like I, I know people that think of that almost at least once a week, I'll hear somebody say, Oh, I want to make this thing out of this thing as a piece of furniture. Like that seems yeah. like something that's easy to express to another person. Mm -hmm. Whereas saying, I want a sculpture that looks like that. That seems like a harder thing to, thing to come by on a consumer yeah. level. And that's also like the sculpture. It's not as it's different for me. My process is really different than say a piece of furniture. Like I, that's, I don't want to say it's not a collaboration, but it's very different. Like I will take what you say and synthesize it. Oh yeah. Versus you like you like size parameters are fine, but there's like a lot of nuance that I've had like misunderstandings with people about that process. Like I just let my gut tell me when something feels icky mm -hmm. or not. Right. Like um, that, the sculpture I prefer to just make and it, you know, like I do want, I do love sculptural commissions, but it definitely has to be the right client, mm -hmm. you know, versus, you know, a table, we can make whatever you want within reason. Well, and a know? sculpture can also be something that becomes an artistic personalization in art like when you make a sculpture you're like that's because i sculpt like this and some people when they do commissions that is the commissions they're doing they're doing drawings for people or something and people will ask because they're like i like the way you draw i want you to draw a picture of me in the style that you draw that picture and that's hard to do with a sculpture because a sculpture is three-dimensional so you picture it more as a real thing is a mm -hmm. way to think of it i guess um, yeah, so I, I could see the difficulty in that, but also I, just like you were saying there, you'd like to do more of them, but that's that type of thing where it's like, I could do something that people would want to consume and have. And then I would rather just sell the artistic type of stuff that I do like as is like going, and here's my work. And on top of mm -hmm. it, here's a functional thing that I do. You know, it's, I, I see that juxtaposition yeah. for sure. Yeah. And we, um, yeah, it's like there's like a lot of like nuance that you need to that like I try to be really mindful about those boundaries of like what I'm comfortable with mm -hmm. and what right because if it is my sculpture, you know, people who want like the whale commission that was a a friend who's a client who really did want something in the way I make it, you yeah. know, so it worked. That's why really I didn't know well. that that was a commission because I'm like that just looks like your work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that 100% is my work, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just like, that was a really excellent way of doing of, of an example of that. And it's um, a gorgeous piece, by the way. Yeah, and it was really that was a really lovely, lovely piece to make. And I would love to make more work like that. Um, but you know, it takes a lot to um, yeah, we'll get there where in the studio we'll have time for more different, different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I look, I look forward to that. Now you had mentioned that you pay for your own equipment. Now, how do you source materials? That's another thing too. If you're making all this stuff and you said you were making custom plywood and things like that, how are you going about finding this material? What's your process for doing something like that? Well, it depends on what the prompt is. There's a couple of local vendors in town 
Um, there are some further out of town. It just depends on if like one vendor has everything I need. Sometimes I have to go to multiple vendors. If the, and I like to be careful where the actual material comes from. Like for me, the material is part of the work of the work, mm -hmm. right? That if you want it, that especially in my sculpture, like the sourcing is really important and like the histories of that material and how it got there and how it sort of became and grew. Like for the table at the union, we did it out of native like Wisconsin white quarter sawn white oak. And we're talking mm -hmm. about trees that are over 200 years old to get this quarter sawn material. But the way oaks grow in um, sort of like a savanna with the supporting prairie flower, right? Like it's an ecosystem. And what we were talking about was the ecosystem of support, right? Mm -hmm. And then I like getting into like what are, how does that play in? Like what are our ties to mythology, like celestial beings, like the Zodiac that can all play into like what constellation can we put in here? You know, so we inlaid, they wanted concentric circles, but I got to inlay the constellation of Cassiopeia because it also makes sort of makes a W that was my one like, oh, okay, we can do that. Okay. But it also plays into the story of a narrative of, of shaming women and trying to re you know, reclaim that space. So like, like I'm saying all the work I do, I like to do sort of talks about all these layers. And then I inlaid, um, I carved and filled a number of like prairie grasses and then women, like they wanted literal women um, on the table. And I was like, how do we talk about, like we're talking about women in education. So we're separating women from birthing, mm -hmm. right? It's an amazing thing that women can do, but we're talking about women's place in education, yeah, right? And like in the scholarly parts of the world. And so I was like, I don't, we'll do it in blue and, you know, purpley blue get away from, you know, and no facial features, you know, so it can be any woman and get away from like, that the bodies could be seen as differently abled, right? And yeah. also making sure that this table, we could fit a wheelchair under it. Because if we're talking about a round table that can include everyone, there's no head of it, that there's no like best spot, mm, okay. you know? So for that, the material really played into the material and it was great that I actually found some lead shot in that material because oh. people hunt in the woods and yeah. things yeah. land places. Yeah, and this is Wisconsin after that, all. <laughs> right, that they let me, I was like, ooh, I wanna put this in the constellation because we're talking about wounding and repair in other metaphorical ways like this is a literal way because you can see from the bullet from the lead shot how the tree heals like and I'm also interested in like forensic botany that plays into like my the material is part of the work of the work um so some things are like that and some people are like I want maple and I'm yeah. like great <laughs> you want maple you know but I try and and that can play into the sourcing, but like the plywood, I reach out to colleagues. Like I, I've worked with plywood, but I'd never gotten custom plywood made. Um, so really digging in and talking to people and doing a lot of research on, it's a whole different vocabulary. Okay. Um, Actually, here's a question now too, if with making this, and again, I talked about the scale of things, but you also talked about how you have people that work with you. Um, where do you find a shop like that? How do you find a studio? How do you go about sourcing a place to be and to find a place that will not only be sustainable, but also, you know, usable and I guess safe because now you've got a bunch of equipment in there and a bunch of custom pieces. So what's your process for finding Absolutely. a studio? Um, so you're also hitting on one of my like, super nerdy like no for, that's all right <laughs> for a while 
Um, I've been a longtime supporter and used to be on the board of a really amazing organization called the Craft Emergency Relief Fund hmm. that um, does a number of different things, but um, they have another website called the Studio Protector, which is for artists writ large. How do you know that, you know, like whether your lease is good and durable? Mm -hmm. How do you know whether, you know, it's safe from fire from, you know, what are the things? And if you do have a flood in your studio, what can you save first, you know, and how to, they're a really, really important organization and they give grants to artists and craft disciplines who have had career or life threatening disasters or emergencies. So making sure you're insured, even though the insurance system is insane, yeah. right? But making sure that because I store my work and it's really hard for artists to find this, the right niche in that, I always advocate for buying your insurance from an actual human. I have an insurance vendor in town so that I can say, what does this mean? What doesn't this mean? And I'm not shooting an email into a void. <laughs> right. But in Madison, there's not much light industrial space. People always ask me how I found my studio, and I found it on Craigslist in 2015. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, okay. Um, so, and like, I talk about things in terms of like amenities, um, until 2020, I did not have heat or control of my heat mm. in my studio and you pay for your amenities. Like people are like, oh, you must have like all of this climate control. And I'm like, no, I actually like now I have heat. I acquired the, the space behind mine in 2020 and you know, and what I've oh, done wow, that long without it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and we ran space heaters and my landlord they were warehousing behind it and there was a heater and I put a box fan in the wall and pulled the heat in oh. to my unit. Okay. Um, but I'd never had a studio that I could control the heat in. Hmm. Like, so I was used to that. And with wood, you do, there are a number of things you need to be careful of, you know, finish right. everything is temperature relative. Um, but like my landlord put in a couple of 220 plugs for me, like having enough power, having enough light, having, um, like at my building, I have dumpster access, there's freight loading. And those are all really amazing things for me to have when I'm getting deliveries to have a, a dock that a freight, they can pull up and there's a business that has most of the building and they are available 24, you know, like mm -hmm. nine to five, they man the dock. So I don't even have to be there, you know, have a good relationship with your, well, that's not true. I don't, some of my neighbors, I don't have a great relationship. Yeah. That'll happen. With, <laughs> and I just like, I can't, I don't have time for, yeah. He's like, think he feels emasculated because I have more table saws than him. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, poor baby. That must be really hard. That's your problem. Like you get, you you know, like you get, a, I have taller ladders than you. I have more table saws than you, but we also do different things. Like what right. if? Um, That's funny. It's insane. I love it. <laughs> now, another thing uh, with your website that I noticed was you also have a section with tutorials. Now, mm -hmm. when did you start making tutorials and what's your process for doing that? So those tutorials are for the kids kits that I make. Okay. Um, and it was important to me, like in my heart of hearts and dreams of dreams, I would also have little zines for it. But oh. that was a 2020 pivot to uh. make you know, like kits for kids. I also think it's really important. There's a lot of studies that kids and, and adults don't have enough manual dexterity. Um, and things like surgeons are not trained, you know, people coming into fields in which manual dexterity is important. They do not have that training from childhood. Um, and so I wanted to make these kits cause everybody, you know, they're the Kiwi kits, but, um, I find that those and like how Legos are, are, are very different than when I was a kid. Like there are mm. too many sets and kids want to make them look like the box. 
and that makes it a binary of a right answer or a yeah, wrong Legos answer. Yeah, Legos were just a pile of something that you're like, where right. did these come from? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you no, just totally. Made stuff. And so these kits, that there's not a right or wrong way to put them together. You can do what you want. Either you can follow the directions or not, but I, I can, in the video, I can talk to kids about like the history of materials and like why things are the way, you know, and like how to do it and how to deal with frustration, which I think, hmm. you know, letting them know that they're, you're doing something that might be really hard for you. And that's really awesome. You know, like I see you. Um, and that like learning how to, ha you know, and every kid and every person needed hammer time during COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, so the tutorials are for that. And I would like to grow that to a lot of other, I have a lot of ideas of where that can go. I've taught some virtual classes on, um, again, trying to balance like woodworking has a really high buy-in generally. Mm -hmm. And I taught a class about repairing, a, a wooden chair or like small table that you find at the thrift store, like repair and alter how to repair something and then change it to make it what you want it to be. Okay. And all the only tool, the only power tool needed was a hand drill. And then, you know, buy like a, a handsaw, a file using like bike tubes for clamping stuff or gravity or leverage. Oh, cool. And that like you can use what, like there's so much that you can do with just what you have right yeah. and the idea in in capitalism that like you have enough and you have everything i also feel is like totally radical okay you know that like and you know and i want to do some simple things for like repairing drywall like i think everybody should know how to repair drywall instead of having to like pay for you know yeah someone to repair drywall and who you let in your house is you know, especially for female bodied people and um, it can, you know, who you let in your house can be tricky. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I could see that for sure. And um, I actually want to ask you another, the, these are going to be a few technical questions because you Great. did start this website. So technical questions in the sense of you jumping into the field of creating this site and this cart and selling these things online. Now, what, first of all, are you using to manage these orders and how are you going about taking commissions from the website that you built? Oh, it went live like December 27th, not okay. November 27th. It's so new. Okay. I get an email when I get an order. <laughs> okay. So I haven't gotten any commission inquiries yet. Gotcha. Okay. But I, I'm assuming it's going to, you know, and this website did not, it was like, I have, um, a really lovely human named Ben helped me build this website. I have a photographer that I work with. I have a photography space in my studio that I rent out to other people. Um, so there's a lot that goes into building like a website versus an e-commerce site has been a lot of a learning curve. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I ask. That is the difference. It's one thing to go or even just using an e-commerce site that's a service already, like saying an Etsy or an eBay or something like that, or even, well, no, Shopify, I suppose, is more of a self run cart, but yeah, mine's on Squarespace, but like there's, you know, I'm grateful that like the Nagus packaging company is near to my studio so I can go get box. That was going to be my next question. Be, right. Like we had to know the weight, the size, the, like I had to get a, a much more accurate scale. Because for the larger stuff, you know, it the scale I had was fine, but this getting into the minutia right. of like, you know, one pound, six ounces versus one pound, nine ounces, mm -hmm. you know, and that how much wiggle room do, do these weighing things? Because wood as a material varies on density, yeah. right? each piece of wood is different because of the growing conditions of the tree it came from. Okay. You know, yeah. there's like no standard weight, like, and figuring out. So I made flat rate shipping zones. You did. Okay. Which also was, you know, took over a day of research of doing zip codes from mm -hmm. Madison, Wisconsin outwards and creating, finding my own shipping zones. Yeah. 
So, what, what did you use to determine the shipping zones? Uh, research. I used, um, so I've been using a, like a second party service called Pirate Ship. There you go. I was just going to say, because Pirate Ship lets you put in zip codes and then gives you an estimate of the yep. rates. Yep. Okay. Yep. Nice. So I used Pirate Ship because the, in, the software, the integration for this, for the website, they won't let you use. So I made flat rate shipping zones because you could not apply your membership discounts to shippers on the platform. Right. For whatever reason. And a lot of my bigger stuff is really expensive to ship. So I wanted, you know, how do you make that more, you know, how do you bring that down for the client? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's funny too. And I don't know if yours does it the same way. So I use square itself, not square space, but I use square because they give you a free, uh, cart website that you can use. But if you, I use it because there's a free version because <laughs> I don't sell that much on my own personal cart yet. But, uh, it gives you the option in the free version to just determine uh, the cost that you're going to charge for shipping by weight. You know, and you just put that in and yeah, so it's, it's easier just to go about that way. And if you can figure it out, like, okay, if it's going to be over a pound, then I'll just charge $7, even though I think with the discount, right. it's like seven twenty nine, and I'm like, and I'll just charge that to people. So it's like, it's covering my costs and I'll eat a little bit of it, but that's the way, that's the way I did it. I did not do by weight because some of my stuff is, has a big volume, right? Even and, though and it length doesn't is have a big weight. difference too. Yeah. At, what is it like the DMI on shipping? It's like your overall weight versus oh. your like calculated space and weight is like slightly different and they'll charge you the higher right. one. Like my bigger mirrors are, you know, they're like a 59 by 28 by eight inch box. And they vary the biggest box I ship in right now. It can vary from 27 pounds to 44 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, uh, you know, but it, it, it's the same space. Yeah. Right. And doing it by weight, it was just easier to make um, that even in the reading in the back end, if your volume changed a lot by weight that that but doing it by weight didn't seem to be the most effective way right. for my stuff. Yeah, no, it's, I realize while you're saying that you're like talking about 40 pounds, like the hardest thing I've had to do is ship something that was almost five pounds. And boy, was that yeah. a nightmare for me? <laughs> no, I mean, I ship a lot of stuff and I ship, you know, like I don't for larger, larger stuff. Um, I mean, I have a logistics company that I use for shipping big sculptures and stuff like that. And that's a whole other language of weight class. Yeah. Right. And shipping class, because that goes from zero to 400 mm -hmm. for shipping freight, you know, and how you calculate that gets calculated is totally different also. But you can like ask for a lift gate on the delivery end, you know, that that's why it's, you know, it's good to work but that doesn't integrate to my website. Right. But yeah. That's that's, for that's, like, so most of that stuff you're having to do on your own. You're just saying you get the orders, you determined what the shipping cost will be, but you take care of all the, how it's going to get out there in the packing and all that stuff. Oh yeah. 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 We do all the, yeah. The packing is all, is all in house and that's yeah. And we're working to like, you know, cause it's all a matter of scale. Like until we scale up, like I'm trying to transition out of bubble wrap and be more, be a hundred percent recyclable. Like I pack and I fill with paper, but we still wrap things in bubble wrap. And how do we get away from that? But it'll be a lot of, you know, I'll get cardboard laser cut and we'll fold it and glue it, you know? Yeah. No, I, I yeah. recently started doing that with a lot of the more smaller fragile items I have, like say mugs or dishes or something like that. I'll pack them individually with cardboard wrapped around the item itself. And then when I put them in a box, I put those cardboard pieces in a large paper envelope because it'll pad it from the sides of it. And it's like, I don't need to use packing material for that. It'll yeah. keep them in place by the envelope that I use because I make it so that it's, it, it 
you know, like it has to be squished into the box so it will be stuck where it is, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been trying to do the same thing. They have a, it's not cheap, but there is a machine that you can run cardboard through and it makes these like perforated. Really? Things. I didn't know that. I have some ceramic friends who have one. Oh, and cool. then you like literally reuse all of it and it makes your fill. Huh. I'll have to check that out. Okay. And then, um, so one more thing, uh, if, is there anything coming up in the future or things that you're doing or projects or just things you'd like people to know about that you'd like to mention before we go today? Hmm. No, we don't have a ton of, you know, I was in some shows. I had a show at the Watchers Gallery, but that came down. Um, no, just keep keep a lookout on the website for for it being filled and and built out. And yeah, we're gonna keep keep working on it. And yeah, and if if anybody has questions about commissions or how the studio works or general feedback on the website, feel free to drop me a line. Okay, and those two websites that you have, your personal and your uh, your store website, where would people go visit those? What's the website? Yeah, so my website? personal website is sylvierosenfall.com. And my business website is loweraastronomystudios.com. And questions, comments, and or concerns can be addressed to hello at loweraastronomystudios.com. I like that. That was like an auto, it was like a prompt response. Like, hello. <laughs> that's from, that's from teaching. That's from teaching college students. Nice. Just saying like questions, comments, and or concerns can be addressed here in class or later in private. You know, I love it. however you want. Well, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. It was great meeting you. Likewise. Thank you for having me. Thank you.